The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. It combines supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep service with just the right sink and just the right bounce. With over 20,000 reviews, think about that, 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress based on Casper, Amazon, and Google reviews. I mean, those are some names you can trust. Free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. But you're going to love it, so don't even worry about it. Designed, developed, and assembled in the USA. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash wrongful. That's www.casper.com slash wrongful. Remember, this is only applicable to the purchase of a mattress, and terms and conditions do apply. Hi, I'm Jason Flom. Before we get into our show, Wrongful Conviction, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Blue Apron. You know, one of the things I love most about Blue Apron is the fact that it's so affordable. I mean, for less than $10, where can you get a meal for less than $10? A delicious dinner or lunch? With Blue Apron, for less than $10 a meal, imagine that. You can have a delicious home-cooked meal. People will think you spent $30, $40, $50 to make the dinner that they're enjoying. And you know what? You're going to sit there like the cat that ate the canary, just sitting there going, wow, this is fantastic. I feel great. I got a good deal, a good bargain. I had a delicious meal. And my friends are happy. Everybody's happy. Your life's just going to be better the minute you start using Blue Apron. Mine is. Now you can get your first three meals free, plus free shipping. That's right. Free meals and free shipping just by going to blueapron.com slash wrongfulconviction. That's blueapron.com slash wrongfulconviction. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I came from a beautiful neighborhood, had a beautiful life. I went to sleep because September 7th was the first day of my high school year. I was going to be a senior. At 22, I was set to start college. I woke up and my life was never the same again. Cops came out with guns drawn and I never saw freedom ever ever since after that. It's like Roach Motel. Once you get in, you're not getting out. On April 19, 1989, 14-year-old Raymond Santana was arrested and charged with one of the most notorious crimes in the history of New York City, the rape and brutal beating of a woman who became known as the Central Park Jogger. Five youths were arrested at 96th Street, all between 14 and 15 years of age. Police are still questioning some of the young suspects they believe were involved in last night. Immediately following the crime, New York City police picked up Raymond and four other teenage boys. They were interrogated separately, they were denied food, water, and access to lawyers, and they were held for between 15 and 30 hours until each of them confessed to a crime they did not commit. And he said, so where were you? And I said, well, I saw it from a distance. I was witnessing it. And he said, that's not good enough. He said, you have to place yourself at the scene. You have to be right there watching it. All five of them were convicted. This is Wrongful Conviction with Jason Flom. Raymond, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Raymond, uh, I want to go back and talk about your crazy life story Mm -hmm. um, because I lived through it. I'm a New Yorker. Yeah. And I remember very well seeing your face on every, the front of every newspaper. And you were one of the most hated people in New York City at the time. Is that fair to say? That's correct. You were like the face of evil. Yes. There is anger over this incident that seems to have only grown in the days since the assault occurred. I also wanted to take them after they get out of jail and put them in the gorilla cage in the park zoo, the new zoo, see if they could survive it. I think that's analogous to what they did to her. The punishment has to fit the crime. Castrate them. They can't. They can't. They can't. Only one problem. You didn't do it. Right. That's, <laughs> That's a right. big problem. That's a big problem. But I want to go even further back than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, what, what's your? where are you from? Where's your family from? Let's talk about your childhood before this all came down. Yeah. Um, originally, I was uh, I was born in Harlem, moved to the Bronx. My, my, my dad was from Puerto Rico. Mother was born here. Um, she's Puerto Rican also. Um, and my childhood was like any other childhood, right? Middle class family. Father worked, you know, at, at a hospital. Um, he was there for about 44 years all total. Um, my mom was a housewife. Um, 
It was so, me and my sister growing up. So you were growing up. I mean, you were 14 years old when this happened, right? That's correct. Yeah. I mean, and when I think about how young that is, and many of the audience have kids, teenage kids. I mean, 14, you're a child. Yes. I mean, at 15 or 16, you're starting to become moving towards adulthood, right? Yeah. But at 14, you're a child. Yeah. Let's face yeah. it. At 14, you know, my dad wasn't even thinking about, all right, let me sit him down and fill out an application, right? Show him how to do that. You know, show him how to uh, take a girl on a date. Like, that stuff wasn't even coming in yet. Yeah, maybe you shaved once by then, maybe not. Not you know? even. Yeah, I mean, you're not going on dates yet. You're like an eighth grader, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, I was about, yeah, about, yeah, seventh, seventh, seventh eighth, eighth grader. Grade, yeah. yeah. So let's go back to the night of this horrendous crime and this terrible nightmare that you and the other four, um, the other four guys went through. First of all, you didn't know those guys, did you? No, I did not. So the case, let's talk about the case a little bit. So the Central Park Jogger case, the fact is, Central Park Jogger case, this was in the, uh, I guess it was in the early 90s, right? Yeah, uh, 80, 1989. Yeah, in 89, right. So the, the crime in New York City was out of control at that time. Yes. Um, there was a lot of fear, a lot of panic, a lot of violence. And this case hit all the trigger points because what happened was there was a woman, uh, a wealthy uh, woman from the Upper East Side, white woman, mm -hmm. who was jogging in the park and, at night yes. and was attacked, dragged into the bushes, yes. and raped and beaten almost to death. Yes. This became a huge uh, uh, flashpoint. A lot of pressure on the cops to figure this out yeah. real quick, right? Mm -hmm. I imagine the mayor, everybody must have been calling, like, get this figured out right now. Yeah. So let's go. Let's go to the night of the of the crime. Mm -hmm. So where where were you? What were you doing? Well, um, it started out because I lived originally. I lived on 119th Street in Le between Lexington and Park. Right next to the twenty fifth precinct. So so Ironically, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> and so as it turns out. Some guys that I went to school with lived in Tav Houses, which is, you know, roughly about five, six blocks away. And that night we planned to go to Schaumburg, um, because there was a party there. That's because, another housing project? Yeah, that's where Yusuf and and Kevin and Corey, they live over there. There's, so so I didn't know like these guys. Out, yeah. yeah, I didn't know these guys. And but there was mutual friends within their group, and there was mutual friends within my group, and that's how we came to meet up in front of uh, Schaumburg and talk to these guys. And then from where, there, where, now just so uh, for people who are listening, that uh, I don't expect people to know this, but yeah. Central Park uh, goes from 59th Street to 110th Street in yeah. New York, and it goes from Fifth Avenue to Central Park West. Yes, this crime happened in the northern section of the park. Yeah, it, uh, around 102nd Street. Right. So naturally, the cops are up there looking, and and they're looking for you know suspects in that area. Yeah. But you weren't, I mean, you were still a good half a mile away, uh, at least, from the crime scene at this yeah. point. So, so you're at the Schomburg houses. How did, let's get to where, how did you get picked up? Where did you guys go from the Schomburg houses? Why did you happen to be standing somewhere yeah. that the cops would happen to look at you and say, let's grab this guy yeah. and the other guys too? Yeah. So what happened was that we went into the park, right? And so me... Just looking at something to do? Just yeah, because we was out, out there talking. There was a bunch of guys, and then guys started going into the park in that 110th Street area, right there on the corner, because that's the corner of the park. They live right across the street from it. And so that was something that they did all the time. Like, they always went into the park and hung out in that corner area there on 110th Street. 110th and 5th? Yes, right. 110th and 5th. So that's um, the east side of the park. Yeah, right? so to them, that was like their backyard. You know, the Schaumburg boys always was in the park. Um, and so we did go to the park with them. Um, and then from there, we wound up traveling to the park. They, they did walk into the park, and they wound up traveling, going south into the park. Um, now, there was some things that happened that night because it was a very large group at this time. Right. You know, right. How many kids? They, we talking over 30 kids. And you were with this group? I was with the group, but I didn't know. I didn't know majority of them. Right. I knew just the guys that I came with. And you were the youngest or one of the youngest? Or? Yeah, I was one of the youngest. Right. Um, and so there were some guys in there who were rowdy. Right. And so one guy did get assaulted. It was a Hispanic man. And then um, I think three people got assaulted by the reservoir. When that happened is when we left the, the reservoir park. is in the park. It's in the I park. Make that clear yeah, the it's in the yeah. park. Um, and so when that last incident happened with those three people is when the group left. Like the guys who I came with, they was like, we're leaving the park. And so. As we left the park, we was on Central Park West, like on around 102nd Street, and that's where the police came and I got picked up at. And so the guys who I came with, 
um, they had left. And so I was there walking with a group of people who I didn't know. And so a small group, a small group. Right. And so when the police did approach, that group scattered. And so one of the officers grabbed me, and then there was another kid who he grabbed by the name of Stephen Lopez, who I didn't even know. And now they grabbed you because you didn't run. Yeah, because I didn't run. And why didn't you run? Because I didn't do anything. Right. Well, so there was no reason to run. <laughs> There's a good answer, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't do anything, and so. And it, you you trusted the cops at this point? Oh, you yeah, 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 yeah. You I, didn't you have know, a I never had no experience. dealings with them. I never had no bad experience with them. So you know, it was no reason for me to run. Right. Right. And so you know, I just I, I told him I said, well, why are you stopping me? Because I ain't do anything. And um, and he pulled. He had the walkie talkie. He hit me over the head with the walkie talkie. Right, he put me on the wall, so I just stood on the wall and I ain't saying anything. And then um, he also grabbed Steve Lopez and put him on the wall. And by this time, the rest of the group, that little group that we was with, they scattered. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so they take, so they arrest you. Mm-hmm. Do you know why you're being arrested? No, at this point I don't. Do you know anything about the Central Park jogger situation? No, at this point? no. word hadn't even gotten out yet. No, no, nothing. Nothing. No, nothing. because we didn't have social media back then or yeah, anything like that. Yeah. It's not like you were checking your phone and there's a <laughs> no, big alert that comes in from CNN. There wasn't no phone. Like I didn't have no right, phone no, back no. then. <laughs> right. So okay. So now you just you don't know what's going on. No, I don't know what's going on now. Now there was some incidents that happened in the park that I saw, but. You know, I didn't have nothing to do with that. So, so to me, it was like, you know, it's nothing to worry about. Well, you're I 14. I mean, you're probably not in a great position to attack anybody anyway. You'd probably be the one getting oh, attacked for at real. this point. Right? I mean, at, at that point, old. I was, you know, 90 pounds soaking 90 wet. 90 pounds. Yeah, you know, I was a small guy. So not yeah, Nothing real scary about 90 pounds. Um, so, okay, so they take you to the precinct in the park, right? Mm-hmm. So, if, again, for our audience, the precinct uh, uh, is in Central Park. Yeah. There's a Central Park precinct. That's what it's called. So they take you to the precinct. Mm-hmm. And, and what happens next? And so I'm there with, because uh, me and this Stephen Lopez, we got picked up the same time um there's another guy well kevin richardson gets picked up too right because officer powers goes into the park he chases kevin richardson down richardson down he hits him in the face with the helmet he tackles him he arrests him um and so there's him and then there's two other guys uh lamont mccall and a kid by the name of clarence so so this is the five of us that get picked up um and so we're sitting in the precinct. Together. Together. Right. So, you know, you go through, like, the whole taking of the pictures, you know, like a mugshot and um, stuff like that. And then they sit us in this room and they say, all right, make your phone call and have your parents come pick you up. Because um, originally what we were given was death appearance tickets, right, <clears throat> to appear in family court. So, so you know, the charges then were, like, trespassing, uh, menacing, these are all like misdemeanor charges that they gave us. And so there we just had to sit and wait until um, our parents came to pick us up. Right. So you called your mom, your dad? I called my dad. Right. And then and you I got told, him on the phone. I got him on I the phone. I was lucky, at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because by that time it was like maybe like 10, 11 o'clock at night. Right. And and yeah. And again, no cell phones back then. I want to no paint a picture phone. here, right? So, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if somebody's not home, they don't answer the phone. Yeah. I had to call about two or three times because he was asleep. Oh, okay. So, know, so, so, okay. So he answers the phone. He must be freaking out. Yeah. He's pissed off. You right. know, um, and so I told him I gotta, you know, you gotta come down and pick me up. And uh, he speaks to the officer. The officer tells him, "Yeah, you gotta come pick me up." So he says, "All right." He doesn't have a car, so they sent. They supposed to be sending the car to pick him up, to come down and pick me up. And so, uh, so you're sitting there for hours and hours. Yeah, and you're a, tired. And, you're probably hungry. Yeah, all of us is in the, in a room, a little bit bigger than this. Um, not in the cell though. Not in the cell. We, we, it's, 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 so okay, so then, uh, so so okay, so your dad comes mm-hmm. eventually, right? Does, yeah, eventually he does comes. Does he take you home? No, um, all the parents show up. My dad is the last one to come. He shows up with my grandmother. Um, they get there like maybe three, four in the morning. Um, so he asks what's going on. So they tell him, they explain to him that it's just a disappearance ticket. We have to appear in family court. They're going to release us. So he goes, okay. So he has to go to work. So he tells my grandmother. He asks my grandmother to stay. Um, so my grandma says, all right, you know, he said, he's going to let him go, take him home. I'll deal with him later. So he goes to work. My grandmother stays there. And then what happens is that, um, they move us out of the small room into the waiting area with our parents. And they say like, they can't let us go because the detectives want to talk to us, but they don't say why. And now it's three, four, five in the morning. Yeah. It's about, and you got picked up at, at 10, 11 o'clock. So, so now a, we're talking like, night. I mean, yeah, it's a long night. We're talking like five, six in the morning, right. maybe even seven. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, we don't know what's going on. We're just sitting there waiting. Have you heard about the Central Park Jogging no, case right now? No, Still don't know anything. Still don't know anything. 
Um, but you're sure not going to ask a lot of questions after you got hit in the head with a radio, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Oh, okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. That'll, that'll, that'll yeah. quiet you down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and especially if you know that I'm going to be released. Right. So, right, so um, you're not going to make any waves. No, right. you know. Um, so we're sitting in this waiting room for hours, and the detectives come, and they talk to Kevin, take Kevin in the room, and then he's in there for hours. So we don't know what's going on, right? No, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's No, by the time they're done with him, it's maybe like 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And you're still sitting there? And we're still sitting there. Did they give you anything to eat? No. We're just sitting there. No water, anything? We're just sitting there. Just sitting there, okay. Just sitting there. It's a long time to just sit there. Yeah. And um, so uh, after Kevin is... I remember them taking Kevin out of the room, and they don't let him come and sit with us. They you know, they take him straight out the, straight out the, uh, the office, and he leaves. Um, he leaves the precinct. And so they call me in next... And so I'm sitting there with my grandmother. So the detective, he, he you know, he, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he introduces himself as Detective Humberto Arroyo, right? He's in the room, and um, and he says, you know, Raymond, uh, we just want to sit down and talk to you about some of the events that happened that night. And so I go, okay, you know, you know, what do you want to know? And so we go into the whole line of question of who I was with, who I came with, what did I see, where was I at, stuff like that. What time did I leave? How did I get picked up? And so, <clears throat> you know, he doesn't he doesn't say anything to me about the jogger for a while. He he talks about just what happened that night. What did I see and who was I with? Right? And and so I tell him that yeah, I did see um these guys assault, you know, the homeless man and, and I did see some of these guys throw rocks at joggers who were running on the reservoir. And and there was one kid who who did assault uh one of the joggers. And and based on that assault is when I decided that it was time for me to leave the park. And so that line of questioning goes on for hours. And then, you know, he gets, he, he, you know, he says to me, well, what happened to the jogger? And I said, well, what jogger? What are you talking about? And he says, the woman. And I say, what woman? I never saw a woman. And he said, so you didn't see the woman jogging in the, in the park? And I said, no. And um, I said, the only woman I saw was when we first entered the park, there was a guy walking with his girlfriend, and he walked through the through the group, and everybody moved out the way and let him and her pass. And I said, that's the only woman I saw. There was no other woman. And um, and so we went back and forth about that for a little bit, right, because he kept trying to, you know, I, you know, ask me the same questions. You didn't see a woman jogger? A woman was raped. And I'm like, no, there was no woman raped that night. I didn't see anything like that. And he said, um, yeah, of course there was. And I'm like, no, there wasn't. And so from there, that's when the line of questioning starts to change. Now things get a little more scary. Still just the one detective and you in the room yeah, and your so, grandmother. Yeah, and my grandmother. But, no, but, what but your grandmother, she didn't speak good English. She right? didn't speak. She couldn't carry a conversation. She knew curse words, right? She could sit there and curse you out in English words. But she couldn't carry a conversation. That's kind of funny, but... Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Especially when she used to say it. It's interesting, right? I mean, the, your case was based on a false confession. Mm -hmm. um, people... I've been I've been working on innocence uh, issues for 20 years, and one of the things people always ask you about: How could anybody confess to a crime they didn't commit? Yeah, it se it seems crazy. Yeah, why would somebody do that? You're basically fucking yourself. Yeah, as like totally. Yeah, right. And I understand it, but to the audience, I think a lot of people probably wondered the same thing: Why the hell would anybody do that? I mean, yeah. you really have to be nuts to yeah, do that, right? Definitely. But you're not nuts. No, you don't seem nuts at all. Far from it. So. Um, <laughs> The very large percentage, well, first of all, the two, first 250 DNA exonerations, 40 of them involve uh, uh, false, false confessions. Yeah. So it's a very big number. And we know that of those, a, a very large percentage of those involve teenagers mm -hmm. because we know that there's a thing called coerced compliant confessions, right, where you're basically being convinced that something good is going to happen for you if you say what the detective wants to hear, 100%, right? That yeah. you're going to get to go home, or you're going to get better treatment, or you're going to get something. And there's a, there's this thing called the Reed method, right, which yeah. is, was developed uh, in Chicago um, by this guy named Reed and, and working with a psychologist. I think he was a detective, where they basically talk you into, you know, in a, in a very sort of smooth way, mm -hmm. they get you to tell a story that they want to hear. Yeah. 
which may have may have no relation to the truth. Yeah. But it makes their jobs easier. Exactly. And then there's a lot of gray areas outside of that too that lead to false confessions, including yeah. you know force, threats, other things. Yeah. Um, but so in your case, because mm-hmm. it's a, you know obviously that's what it came down to. And yeah. It's, a, it's the most powerful thing to a jury too when you yeah. hear a false confession and you're on a jury. And we've seen cases, many cases, where there was DNA that proved that the guy couldn't have been the guy that did it in the first place, presented to the jury, and the jury was like, "They, no, nah, I don't know, the guy said he did it, yeah. so uh, there must be some crazy other explanation, because I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to look at the science, I'm not going to believe science. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like that Chris Rock line, right? He says, when you, when you, if you walk in, uh, if your girlfriend walks in on you with another woman, and, and it catches you in the act, you go, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes, right? <laughs> so it's almost like that. But anyway, so back to this, so, so you're, um, so now you're, you're there, you, you've got to be getting, feeling desperate by now, you've got to be exhausted. Yeah. Confused. Yes. Tired. Yes. Definitely lonely. tired. Definitely tired. And over. And you're overmatched. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You, they've got. They've got the whole weight of the New York City Police Department behind them, mm-hmm. right? And they've got detectives, experienced detectives. That's right. And you've got your grandmother who can only speak English uh, curse words. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's basically the team. That's Team Santana right now. That's it. Right. You, that's a 14 year old, 90 90 pound kid. Yeah. And grandma. Who, who, you know, may, may whip out a, a little English Tourette's. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, she's speaking Spanish, and this, and then this interrogation is not being conducted in Spanish. So, That's right. So, okay, so, so now it's, it's, you've been there for 14, 15 hours by yeah. now. Right? Yeah. And now how does it turn, how does he get you into this? How do they convince you to, to confess to this crime? All right, so, so what happens is that the line of questioning starts to become a little more forceful, right? You know, he... he uh, he starts to get frustrated. He starts to get upset at me. You know, he says that I'm not telling him um, what it is that he wants to hear. He says that I'm holding stuff back. Um, you know, even when my grandmother intervenes, he tells her in Spanish that I'm not telling him everything, that he feels like I'm hiding things. Um, and so, you know, you have to look at the dynamics of the situation and and understand that I was a kid that was 14. I never had no involvement with the law. You know, he's a seasoned veteran detectives who do this daily. And so... And, and he wants a confession. And he wants he, he a confession, wants a, you know. By now, this case is on the front page of the newspaper. Yeah. It's the yeah. number one thing in New York City. The press made you guilty. The whole New York City was convinced that these were the guys. You saw their pictures everywhere. Of course, they took the fun, scariest pictures they could find of yeah. you guys, right, make you look like criminals. Yeah. And and plastered those everywhere. Yeah. And so, yeah, you were uh, uh, you were public enemy number one at this point. At this point, yeah. And, and so he knew that even there was a pressure with them to get this confession. And so, so for me, what happened was that um, there's a knock at the door, right? So there comes a knock at the door, and um, this detective comes in who speaks Spanish. And he talks to my grandmother, and he says, listen, can you step outside? Not a lawyer, another guy. Another guy. Right. And, and uh, he asks my grandmother, can, you, can she step outside? And he's talking to her in Spanish. He takes her out in the hallway, and he closes the door. And at that point, the line of questioning becomes a little more harsher, right? It, it, it becomes, stop lying to me. You're going to give me what I want. And in that same instance, as she goes out, another detective comes in. And so... The third one. Third third guy, right? Real tall detective, um, slim guy. And he comes in and he's making small talk with Arroyo. And I'm just sitting in a chair. I don't know what's going to happen. And then he gives me this look. And he says, what the fuck are you looking at? Right? And, I'm, you know, there's a part of me that wants to say, who, me? But I don't say shit. I just stay quiet. And then um, and and then he makes, like, this step towards me, right? And I go, oh, shit, this guy's about to kick my ass, right? But at that moment, there's the knock, right? The door opens. My grandmother walks in. This detective walks out. And so my grandmother sits down. And I'm like, whew, you know, I just got saved. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, Arroyo starts from the top. Okay, who were you with? What did you do? What did you see? What's going on? And I give him the same story. You know, during this line of questions, it goes on for a a couple of hours. Then comes another knock at the door. So now the same knock comes. The same detective comes in, talking Spanish, speaking Spanish to my grandmother. So he says, is this a scumbag who did it? And Arroyo says, yeah. But he's not giving us what we want to hear. And so um, he pulls this chair really close up and he sits down and he starts to talk in my ear and he's and he, and he talking real forcefully. And he's not really loud, but, you know, I could just I could feel the 
pressure on my ear from him talking. And he says, you know, you fucking did it. You know you did it. You're going to jail. And as he starts to talk, then a royal starts to yell at me. So I got them coming from two different angles, right? And I could just sit in the chair and freeze because I don't know what to do, right? And so... There is nothing to do. There is nothing to do. And and, and so he's, he's yelling in my ear and he says, you're going to jail, you're going to prison, you fucking did it. And then a, a royal is yelling at me. And that knock comes, right? And the detective let my, lets my grandmother back in. And at that point, I start to cry a little bit, right? Well, so now, yeah. right, my, this guy gets up, he walks right out. So my grandmother comes in, she sits down, and now she looks at me, and she can see, like, something is wrong, right? And, and, and she sees the tears, but she don't know because she doesn't see anything else happening. She just sees me, right? And then she goes, well, what's going on? And and the royal says, no, you know, like I told you before, you know, we just feel like he's not telling us everything. He's holding something. And then he says, well, let's start from the top. Once again, Raymond, tell me who were you with and who, what did you see? And, and we're going through the whole story. And, and by this time, I'm, I'm kind of beat down. I mean, you right? haven't slept? I haven't slept. I haven't ate nothing. And so I'm just sitting there and I'm talking to him. And then comes the knock one more time, right? The same detective comes in. He says, Miss Cologne, can you come out? And she gets up, right? She gets up, and she walks out, and the door closes. He starts talking to me, and then he gets frustrated, right? Detective Royal gets frustrated. He starts cursing at me. You're going to fucking tell me what I want. I'm tired of this shit. And, and he bangs on the table, you know, really hard. And at this point, he lunges at me, right? And I go, shit, this is it. I'm going to die right in this precinct. And so when he lunges at me, somebody stops him, right? So the whole time there was a detective behind who I didn't see. He stops him, right? He says, what the fuck are you doing? He starts cursing. Oh, what the fuck is going on? You guys, get him. The classic technique, good cop, bad cop. <laughs> I'm everybody 14 years old, I don't know that, no, right? everybody watches TV. I'm talking about who's <laughs> listening now. Yeah, you don't know. All your scared shit yeah, is out of is your mind. CSI, law and order. I don't know this stuff. And and he kicks, you know, get out the room. Get out the room. Get the fuck. Yeah. Royal gets up, leaves out. The guy closes the door, right? And at that moment, I'm like, whew. Whoever this guy is, he just saved my life. Right, he's your friend. He's my friend. And, you know, and he Now you have, now you have hope. We have now I have hope. hope. Now you have hope. Now I have, have a little hope. He says, hey, you know, Raymond, you don't know me. I'm Detective Hardigan, right? And, and and I hear what's going on, and, and you know, it's a serious case, serious crime. And, and he goes into, like, he pitches it so well where he's like, you know, you a good kid. You know, I know you ain't do this, but these kids, they ain't these other precincts. And they saying you did it. And I don't want you to go to jail. You know, you got to help me here. I'm trying to help you. You want to go home, right? right? He just saved you. Maybe just saved your life. And, and this guy's me, a terrific guy. He's, he, that's the proof. He just right. saved me from getting killed in the prison. So I'm like, yeah, he's, he has my best interest at heart. Yep. You know, and he says, you know, I, I need you to help me. You got to give me at something. At this point, you're like, I want to help this guy. Yeah. This guy's going to get me out of here. <laughs> I'm trying to, right. you know. So then, so what does he need you to do? So so he pulled out this picture of Kevin Richardson. And he says, do you know this guy? And I say, no. And he said, well, this is Kevin. And um, you see the scratch on his face? And I say, yeah, because he had a, the mugshot. You can see it. You know, you can see it. And he says, well, that, that scratch came from the jog when she was fighting him off. Now, I know, we know he's going to jail, right? You can't do nothing about that. But I don't want you to go to jail. So you got to give me something. You got to help me here. Right? I'm trying to help you. You got to help me. You want to go home, right? You got to help me. And then he just left the picture and he sat back. And he just waited. He just, he just got quiet. You know? And as a 14-year-old kid, I'm sitting there saying, I don't even know this guy. Right? But I'm, I'm trying to get this pressure to stop. Because if this guy leaves the room, then I got to deal with these detectives coming back in here again. And this is all going to start all over again. Right. It's never going to end. It's never going to end. And so, you know, for me, you know, I'm a 14-year-old kid, right? What do we do at 14? We know how to lie to our parents, right? And so that's what came to mind. My came to mind was lie, you know? And, and so I said, well, he did it. <laughs> We're going to get right back into this conversation, but first, a few words about our sponsor. 
Blue Apron helps me avoid a lot of the pitfalls of being, let's just say, I'm not a great cook. I had a date recently, and I offered to cook dinner. I don't know what came over me, but I offered to cook dinner, and she came over, and I bought some stuff at the supermarket, and it just didn't work out the way it was supposed to. She ended up laughing at me, <laughs> and I think we had to order in. I get the stuff delivered right to my home. It comes perfectly proportioned. It's fresh. It's organic. It's delicious. And the fact is, now I can cook like a, like a chef, and it just keeps getting better. Now you can get your first three meals free, plus free shipping. That's right, free meals and free shipping just by going to blueapron.com slash wrongful conviction. That's blueapron.com slash wrongful conviction. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And now, back to my conversation with Raymond Santana. And, and so I said, well, he did it. And he said, he did what? And I said, well, he raped a woman. And he said, all right, what else did he do? What did you see him do? Here's a clip of Raymond's confession, which was used at trial. He was telling her mouth. Every time she was told, he was smacking. He said, shut up. He kept smacking. And so I actually sat there and fabricated a story just involving Kevin Richardson. Right? Because right. in my mind, that's the only picture you gave me, so he's the rapist. Well, right. And you're going home. And I'm going home. And, and, and I'm lying, but so what? You figure that out later on. So what happened was that he said, okay, so what did you see him do? So I said, I saw Kevin struggling with this woman, and he took her down. And he said, did you see him rape her? And I said, yeah. And then he said, well, what about Antron McCray? And I go, well, I don't know who Antron McCray is. And he said, well, Ray, you know, he was there. And I said, he was? He said, yeah. He said, you know, we know he was there. And I said, okay, well... You know, Antron was holding her arm, you know. Um, now, by the way, what's crazy about all of this, on top of all the other stuff that's crazy about all of this, which is everything, <laughs> is that the, we, we, of course, find out later yeah. that the woman was that was raped by one guy and yeah. one guy only and yeah. that they knew this. So here they are, right? Even if they got the right guy among the five of you, they still got four guys that they know that they could know. not possibly that have had know. anything to do with this. That's correct. But they have no problem with that. But they have no problem with that. Like they sleep at night, they go home, their yeah. families, everything's fine. Yeah. I never understand that. Yeah. I don't understand it. Yeah. So now they got the two guys. They got you identifying the two guys as yeah. being there. And, right? and, and then the third one is Steven Lopez. So, that, so they, they, they say, well, what about Steven? And I go, well, I don't know. I don't know Steven. And he said, well, he was there, you know. You got to put him in there. He was there. And so... At this point, you're already deep into this yeah, tale of, I'm, I'm you know, a, you're yeah. lying you're through your teeth anyway. You're exactly. like, oh, I just... Uh, but, so, and you're more and more tired and hungry and everything else. Yeah, yeah. And, With Steven Lopez, you know, I didn't know Steven. Steven was sitting out in the waiting area. And um, I didn't know who he was. And, and he said, well, we know Steven did it. And he said, you know, this woman, you know, she lost a lot of blood. And we don't know if she's going to make it. And we know that she had all these injuries on her. And it had to come from somewhere. So he said it had to come from either rock a brick or a pipe, right? And so this is what he told me. So he actually gave me options to choose which one. And then I said a brick. And he said, well, who used the brick? And I said, Stephen Lopez. And so that became the brick that was introduced later on in the case. Right, um, which we know there never even was a brick. Then the, yeah, exactly. Right. The prosecutor brought in the brick that she said was used to bash the woman's head in, the jogger's head in, into the trial, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. What happened is that um, she, uh, uh, you know, because of my statement said it was a brick that was used, um, she brought the brick in during the trial, and she presented the brick, and and, and this, she says it. This is the brick that was used in the assault on, on the jogger. She, she held it up? She held the brick up. and, and well, That's powerful for a jury, right? No, definitely. And, and, the, and the brick also, the next day, it was on the front of the New York Newsday. You know, a it, brick. A brick had his own front page cover on the New York News Day and said this was the brick that was used in a jogger case. And so when they did the reinvestigation years later um, and they tested the brick, there was no blood on it. There was nothing on the brick. So they just found a brick somewhere and just Who knows it where they got it from? That could have been on the way from the D uh, prosecutor's office coming to the courthouse and they picked it up and said, this is it right here. Yeah, she probably had it on her desk like a paperweight for a while. She's so <laughs> proud of it, right? Probably. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. It's so fucking ridiculous. The fact that she would hold up a brick when there was no brick. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in imagination land now. Yeah. Like, deep into, like, I mean, that's kind of psychotic. Yeah. But, yeah, I just, uh, I, I, 
I mean, at that point, yeah, you're you're screwed. I yeah. mean, the jury sees that, and they're like, "That's the that's the brick. That that's poor, the brick. That poor woman. Yeah. These scary kids. A poor woman with a br- oh my god. Yeah, this this fight was fixed from the beginning. This fight was fixed. Talk about a brick shit house, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's not a great analogy, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and and so afterwards, you know, he wrote everything down, and then he said, you know, all right, you did great, sign it, and then I signed it, and then he said, well, I need you to do two. I need you to do two more things for me. And then, and then you good to go. And I said, well, what? And he said, um, I need you to give the same statement that you have here in front of you, give this to another detective, and then do the videotape. And I said, all right, it was fine. Because in my mind, you know, this was the guy who saved me, right? And so he was making sure that I was going to go home. Right, this is going to be evidence of you not doing it, right? Yeah, yeah. As far as in, your, in your twisted mind at this point, which has been jumbled up in 20 different ways, yeah. you're thinking, oh, great. This is going to be more evidence that will prove that I, w- I didn't do it. Yeah. So how did they, even now, it seems like if I'm listening to the podcast, I'm saying, mm-hmm. well, okay, mm-hmm. but you didn't really say anything that you did it. Mm-hmm. So where's the confession come in, right? Yeah. And so, and this was really, when, when I heard you speak last time, <clears throat> I was really, uh, it really hit me hard. I, I've been thinking about it a lot. So how did they get you to place yourself I mean, you saw it, right? Yeah. But that's not a crime. That's Wit- not a crime. Witnessing a crime witnessing is, not a crime. is not a crime. You didn't go to prison for witnessing a crime. No. Okay. Okay. So, 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 how's it now? It goes <laughs> now. It goes downhill fast. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because so what happens? What happens is that, and even the way he did it, you know, he, he said, "Listen." He said, "Okay." So, so you, you saw Kevin rape the woman. You saw Stephen Lopez hit her with the brick, and you saw Antoine McCray was holding her. Right. And he says, so where were you? And I said, well, I saw it from a distance. I was witnessing it. And he said, that's not good enough. And I said, what do you mean it's not? He said, you, you know, you can't sit there and witness it from a distance because right. it's questionable. Right. right? It's nighttime. It's nighttime. You, right. How could you see Kevin, you know, having sex with this woman? He said, you have to place yourself at the scene. You have to be right there watching it. Right. And, and I said, OK. And, and he said, it, that's the only way it's going to be believable. Did he offer you anything to eat or drink at this time? No, no. Even he, no. even the nice guy didn't even do that. Even nice that. guy didn't do that. Nice guy just came been... in and said, "This is it right here," and and um, and so. But you can see now. You can see daylight. You're like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. You know, my, like like Kevin said in, in in the film, he said, at this point, you just have to sell it. And so he says, you have to place yourself right there. You have to see everything in order to say that you saw it. You know, where were you? And I said, well. I was there, and he said, okay, where? And I said, I was on the side. He said, what did you do? And then I said, well, I reached over, and I grabbed the jogger's breast. And he said, that's all you did, right? And I said, that's all I did. And he said, okay. All right, and so... And what what possessed you to say that? Like, because you kind of pulled that one out of thin air. I mean, at this point, you've told 20 lies already. I did, I did. And and it came from me... uh, uh, Wanting to be believed that I was at the scene, right. and then me saying, "Well, this was a lesser role, right?" right. You're like, like, yeah, because I couldn't say that I held her because I said Antron did it. Had you even grabbed a woman's breast by this point in your life? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe once. Not a woman. Huh. A girl. <laughs> I was yeah, a girl. Right. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So you made this up, right? To, so, to, yeah. to, just to add a little. Yeah. Uh, because extra I couldn't. You know, I, I the already story. said Kevin raped her, and I already said. Steve hit her with the brick, and I already said Antron held her. And you, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that once you say that, you're just as guilty as everybody else. Now it's, you know, it's a... Uh, you're, exactly. You're, you're part of the group, even though you didn't uh, play, you, you didn't implicate yourself in, in hitting her or yeah. raping her or strangling her or doing anything like that. Yeah. But now you're guilty as everybody else. But now else. I'm guilty as everybody else. Right, they got you now. Now they got me. Right, so now what happens? And so then um, he said, okay, you did good, you know... Uh, you know, he, he tells me, he wants me to go to another precinct. He wants me to uh, tell the same story to this other detective. And um, and then that's what I do. So they pick me up. They take me to another precinct where I sit in an interrogation room with... Uh, Are there TV cameras now waiting for you and things like that? Yeah. Well, we, we, we come out. When we go to the precinct, there's cameras there. And he says, look, just walk right in. Don't look at the cameras. Just keep walking right in. Um, but I still don't know what's going on. Yeah, because I'm trying to paint a picture for the audience. Right? Like, if you didn't live in New York back then, you can't imagine. Yeah. That this was really one of the most notorious crimes in New York history. Mm-hmm. Definitely, I mean, yeah. 
And and that's a lot of history there. Yeah. But it was, I mean, it crystallized, like I said, everybody's fears mm -hmm. of these predators roaming in the park, these scary minority kids who yeah. were like super predators, they yeah, used to call them. Yeah, that's where the right? term came from, super predators. Super predator. predators, right? They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. There is anger over this incident that seems to have only grown in the days since the assault occurred. For a city that has been simmering for years over the issue of race, this vicious crime with young black defendants and a white female victim brings the issue to the boiling point. And these kids should be made examples for the rest of the country that if you do a crime, you're going to get convicted. If you're guilty, you're either going to jail or you're going to hang. So at this point, every camera's out, everybody, but you still don't know. You still don't know. You still don't know. know. But you, so now you're like, okay, so you go through the cameras. So we go, go, go to another precinct, and um, I meet uh, Detective Mike Sheehan, right? Mike Sheehan uh, uh, was part of Homicide North Detective Squad, went on years of being movies and, and, and be a, a reporter for several di different uh, news stations. And so <clears throat> I go in there, I meet him. And we go in the room, and he says, look, you know, you spoke to Hardigan already. And I said, yeah. He says, so you know what we're going to do here, right? And I said, yeah. He said, all right, well, just tell me the same thing you told Hardigan, and I'll write it down. And that's how I went. So, you know, but because I'm selling it, that first statement with Hardigan, maybe two and a half pages, right? This statement turns into, like, five, Right, because now you're embellishing the story. Yeah, because now he's pulling details and stuff, and he's asking me stuff, and I'm just making stuff up as we go along. Well, at this point, it's easy work for him. Yeah, he could have said he he could have said that you uh, uh, that you kidnapped the Lindbergh baby, and I could have been like, yeah, that you was me. Like, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that happened the same night. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah. And the Manson murders. Yeah, I would have. So yeah, I was out there in California. I'd, yeah, 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 helped the skeleton and all that stuff. That was you. <laughs> he would have been like, yeah, can I go home now? Yeah, right. Yeah. And can I get a, a sandwich at least? Something. You know, give yeah. me a sandwich while I'm telling you this story. Right. So you would have confessed to anything. I would have um, confessed to anything. Right. And this, so at this point, he's got you. Now you. So let's just fast forward a little bit. Okay. Right? So now you're, the, all of this is done. Yeah. Right. And you're taken away to jail. Yeah. To where? Spofford Detention Center. Right. And so, and, and you have a sense it's it's dangerous. Definitely. And you're okay. So now, how long did it take to get to trial? Um, it took us uh, about a year, almost almost say about a year and a half. So you're in jail for a year and a half waiting for trial. Yeah. yeah. Um, and were the other kids in the same jail with you? At this point, everybody started to get bailed out. So, so it was all of us that came in together, and we got split up. And then what happened was everybody. So Kevin got bailed out. Yusuf got bailed out. Stephen Lopez got bailed out. Antron McCray got bailed out. And then I was the last one. And um, and then Corey was on Rikers Island. So you got bailed out. I didn't get bailed out. Oh. I mean, the bail must have been high. No, it was. It was. It started at about two hundred fifty thousand, and then as the months went on, it, it, it got lower to one fifty, then a hundred, then fifty thousand, and then it finally went down to twenty five thousand. And um, this was the time when Al Sharpton was raising money to get everybody out. Okay. Um, but I don't know what happened when it came to me getting out. The money wasn't raised. Okay. Mm. So that's weird too. But um, mm -hmm. so so then you go to trial. So then I go to trial. Did you think you were, did you think you were going to be uh, convicted? No, because at this point the DNA evidence is there. Nothing matches, right? You know, they took handprints, footprints. They took hair samples. They took blood samples. They took all of our clothes, um, and they sent it to the lab, and nothing matches, right? So, so you know, there's the hope. All right, there's no physical evidence to prove that we did anything, and so. Um, Who's your lawyer? I had a lawyer by the name of Peter Rivera from the Bronx. He was originally handling my father's divorce paperwork, and then he became a lawyer, all right? So you got a divorce lawyer. I got a divorce lawyer. And right? to fight for your life. To fight for my life. And, um, you know— Let's uh, just think about that for a second. <laughs> divorce lawyers aren't even good at divorces. Exactly. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know how many of you out there have been through that, but mm -hmm. I have. I don't want to denigrate that, by the way. There are a lot of good divorce <laughs> lawyers out there, too, so I don't mean to, yeah. you know, but the fact is that's that's crazy. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. but he was competent, you felt? Nah, I, you know, I, you know, I, when I look back at it, there was a lot of things that I felt that he could have did that he didn't do. Um, he didn't fight enough, 
you know. Um, and were you tried together separately? We were no. It was me, Antron McRae, and Yusuf Salam tried together. And it's a media circus. Yeah. Oh, definitely. By this time, you know, the articles are being written. Within the first two weeks, there were four hundred articles written about us, um, dissecting our lives. And, and again, you got Trump saying you guys should yeah. be executed. He then went the, out of his way. Then the ad he came took out. out. A, he took out an ad. Yeah. He put eighty five thousand dollars on the ad in the major four major newspapers, calling for the death penalty. You better believe that I hate the people that took this girl and raped her brutally. You better believe it. Because he's a, he's an expert on this stuff. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. he would have executed all five of you guys. And oh, by yeah. the way, I don't think he would have lost any sleep over it either. No. I believe I, You know, I mean, even yeah, years later when we got exonerated and, and we, we went through the lawsuit, he said, you know, it was the biggest heist in New York City history. Right. You okay. know? Okay. So. Yeah, because he knows. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so... So you, you you're now you you're going through this trial, mm -hmm. um, the circus, the whole thing. You've been in jail for um, at this point a uh, year and a half, yeah. which is as a fifteen and a half year old kid, yeah. a pretty big percentage of your life. Yeah. So now you're uh, you're there and uh, you're still expecting that justice is going to be done. That's right. Because you didn't do anything. That's right. And you got DNA. And I got DNA now. So you so you got all this forensic evidence. Yeah. And you're ready to go home now. It's going to be fixed. And then the verdict comes in. Then the verdict comes in. And the first, tra the first charge was attempt murder. And they said not guilty. And so we said, okay. And then from there, the rest of the charges was all guilty. Um, let's talk about the experience and, and, and you know, the, the, the tension and, and just thinking about you in that courtroom and waiting for that verdict and the stomach and the pain and the everything. I, I can't even... That's why I do this work that I do, yeah. because I can't imagine what it's like to go through this. Nobody can if you haven't yeah. been through it. Um, I'm amazed you're here, smiling, laughing, <laughs> yeah. you know, got your Park Madison shirt on. Yeah, yeah. This new fashion line, <laughs> Park Madison, NYC. I want to put in a plug for that. So now you're now you're off to prison, um, and then a crazy thing happens, right? You're, you're in prison mm -hmm. for uh, seven years you served, right? Seven years. Because you were a juvenile. Because I was a juvenile. So that was the most they could give you. Yeah. Right. And then you get out. Then I get out. Now you're out. And now you're I'm thinking, out. okay, now I can start my life. Got yeah. an associate's degree while you were in prison. That's correct. Right? So you're like, you're, you're bettering yourself, doing the best you could while you're in there. That's correct. And then, um, which prison were you in? Um, they, they shipped me to Goshen Secure Center, and I served five years there. And then um, they shipped me to Downstate Correctional, and then I got released from there. So. I mean, you say it so casually, five years there, like five years. Imagine five years at the Holiday Inn would be torture, right? <laughs> I mean, and this is not the Holiday Inn it's by not any stretch of imagination. Inn. This is, I mean, we're talking violence, terrible food, loneliness, yeah. all the stuff, noise, all the stuff that goes with it. Yeah. Um, so you get out, and now you find out that your prospects for getting employment are basically zero. Like, I filled out several applications. Nobody would hire me. Because, um, you know, there's that question that says, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And you go, yes, and um, don't even get a call back. And then somebody said, well, just put, we'll discuss upon interview. And then I said, all right, let's try that. And so you, we'll discuss upon interview, and then they call you in and say, well, you went to jail? And I, yeah, for what? And it, rape. Oh, no. now you know job. And you're a registered sex offender. And you're a registered sex offender. And then if somebody does say, okay, well, you know what? You went to jail for rape. Things happen. Well, what happened? And then you go to Central Park Jogger case. And they're like, okay. Okay. All right, well, we're just closing up for the day. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. Yeah, because now you're a level three or level one. Like, you're like the highest level of a sex offender there is. Yeah, and that's, so, that's the, 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 so there's nobody's hiring. Oh, nobody's hiring. Nope. So, nobody's so you're, hiring. You're, so you still got to feed yourself somehow, right? Yeah. So what happens is that... um. At this point, I just, for me, because now it started to take a toll on me, right? That I was in society. I had a 9 o'clock curfew, a 7 o'clock curfew. Um, I couldn't get a job, you know. Um, these characteristics that I brought with me from prison were starting to surface now. The pent-up aggression, um, not wanting to be around a lot of people in the room, not wanting to re uh, be around kids, um, not wanting to be around a woman by myself, right? Because people start to look at that. Um, walking on eggshells on a daily basis. Yeah, all this anytime person, you see a cop, you got to be... Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So so you got a lot of PTSD-type syndrome yeah. uh, symptoms, and then and then so you got mixed up in drugs a little bit. Yeah. Right? As, so as yeah. I so mean, for me, what happened was that, you know, you know, these guys on the corner, they're getting a lot of money. I can see it every day. 
They're sitting there, they, they, they're doing what they don't have to do it. And, 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 and in my mind, they was like, well, you know what? I don't have to fill out an application for that. Right. Right? I don't even have to go to a job interview. I could just come out there. Everybody else is doing it. Yeah. Everybody no, else is by doing the it. way, uh, you have to understand, I believe that drugs should be legal <laughs> and uh, should be decriminalized and taxed and regulated. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working in that field uh, for 24 years, even longer than this. So uh, you're going to find me very sympathetic on this particular subject, you know. Yeah. Um, but that being said, so you got arrested. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I got arrested with, uh, and I was charged with criminal possession with the intent to distribute. And so, you know, for me, you know, uh, uh, I had a high bail, right? Uh, I had a parole hold, and I knew I was guilty of this case. Yeah. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't about sitting there fighting the system. It was just about give me something that I can handle. Because I knew I was guilty. Right, and now you're an adult, and now you've been through the system, and there's nothing they can show you that you haven't already seen. That's correct. Right, not as scary. Not as scary. Right. And um, so, you know, they gave me a three and a half to seven year sentence, and I said, all right, I'll gladly take that because I was guilty. And this is where it gets really interesting. Mm hmm So you're back in prison, this time for something you did do, mm -hmm. and a crazy thing happens. Yeah. There's crazy a guy named happened. Matthias Reyes. guy named Matthias Reyes, who, who who's serving a 33 and a third year to life year sentence for murder and several rapes um, is sitting in, in a prison with Corey Wise. You know, Corey Wise... One of your co-defendants. One of my co-defendants who's, at this point, he's in his 13th and a half year, right? 13 never been, and a half years. Never been released, you know, never... No programs, no nothing. He's just been in prison. And he sees Corey in the yard walking around and he, he approaches Corey, right? And he doesn't tell Corey that he's the person who committed the crime. But what he does is he engages in a conversation with Corey, because back in 1989, they was on the same housing unit, right? And they had a fight over the TV. And so he comes to Corey and he says, hey, you remember me? Corey says, you know, the looks at him, he says, we had a fight in 89 over the TV. And Corey says, yeah, I remember you. And from there, he starts to tell Corey how his faith and religion has changed and, and how he's trying to be better and do better things in life. And they engage in a dialogue. And based on that dialogue, he never told Corey he was the person who committed the jogger case. He didn't do that. He just spoke to Corey, and, and the conversation made him feel a certain type of way that he felt he had to do something. And so that's where it started, where he actually went and he talked to the prison chaplain. And this was the first person that he told that, you know, somebody's in this prison for a crime that I know I did, and they've been here all this time, and they're innocent. And then that's how the ball starts to roll. This is the first time you've heard me shut up because I'm just sitting here trying to, like, process this, right? And, and, and this guy, like, he didn't just tell the story once. He told it over and over and over, even till it got to Albany, and, and, and they had to send an investigator. The DA's office had to send somebody to go talk to him, and he told them the story. And so... And he, he was the sole perpetrator. This and he time. was the sole perpetrator. He was known as the East Side Slasher. All his crimes he committed by himself. All his victims had the same kind of injuries. And he had been under investigation prior to the Central Park Jogger case. That's correct. He right, committed so a rape in Central Park two days before the rape on the Jogger. And they had some information that they were looking at him as a yeah, suspect. He, right? had a, he had a scar on his chin. The lady who he raped in Central Park two days before ID'd him as having a scar on the chin. So one of the detectives uh, who was looking for him, they went to the hospital and they find out who was the last person that had stitches and they found Mateus Reyes. And so this information came to uh, Linda Fairstein, who was she the head of... I got the chills all over the place. Here. Go ahead, <laughs> goosebumps. This information came to Linda Fairstein, who was the head of the sex crimes unit, around the same time that the DNA evidence from our case came back. It was about six weeks. And it came around the same time that it came back that said that uh, it, there was no match. And so she had, she had the information on her desk, but she chose not to either talk to us again. She chose not to entertain an alternative theory or an alternative suspect. She just chose to go forward with this case. Yeah, it's it's. It, I, what can you even say about that? I mean, it's like I'm so angry about it, and I wasn't the one who got victimized here. Um, and there's a lot of victims here, right? The woman who didn't get justice. That's correct. The uh, society who wasn't protected from this guy who truly is evil. Yes. Uh, and then the five of you guys, and then your whole families. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Like, I think people need to understand that when we lock up the wrong guy, 
by definition, we stop looking for the right guy. That's correct. That guy is then free to go out and commit more yeah. terrible acts against innocent people. Yeah, Reyes um, went on to commit a murder and I think four additional rapes. Right, so a murder and four rapes. That's the scorecard of if Fairstein would have done her job, yeah. which was right in front of her. Right in front of it her. It wasn't tricky. wasn't tricky. Right? It wasn't like the, the, this one came with instructions, right? Yeah. And all she had to do was look at it and say, yes, I'm going to do my job, my sacred duty to protect the public mm -hmm. and the citizens, of which you are one. That's right. And I'm going to investigate the obvious lead that is going to lead me to the right rapist, yeah. in this case, and, and almost killer. And she didn't do it yeah. because it was inconvenient mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. And she probably liked all the press she was getting, I'm guessing. Oh, definitely. And uh, and as a result, uh, it's really... It, it, I can't imagine how those people must feel that were victims of Reyes, uh, knowing that he could have been and should have been off the street, and they and their families never would have had to. I can't imagine if it was my daughter or my sister or my mother or somebody else who he victimized... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I I I can't. Um, the the amount of anger is is really uh, it's hard to to even put it into words. Yeah. There's a so, there's a report. There's a report that's that was done by the DA's office called a Nancy Ryan report. It's about 52 pages long, and it tells you on why we're innocent. All the evidence and the reinvestigation as to how we're innocent. Reyes went on to even solve unsolved crimes. Because they, they, yeah, because they never bothered to look into for these other, even though he, even though it was in a neat pattern, like I yeah. said, this one was with, a, this one came with instructions. Yeah. So now, so okay, so now we, as we're nearing the end of this, uh, mm -hmm. this show, so by some miracle, he ends up in the prison with, uh, with Corey. Yeah. And he has this uh, moment of, of uh, uh, he has this awakening, and then he has this moment of uh, feeling guilty, yeah. which is a bad word in this particular case, um, but. Uh, and then he uh, he spills the beans. He spills the beans. And now you're in prison, and you get the word. How does this happen? You get the word that you've been uh, exonerated. Well, you know, what happened was I, they, they, they bring me back down, and they question me, right? They question me because it's not that simple for them to just let us go. To them, Reyes is the sixth man, right? To them, we knew each other. We was in co-host with each other. And so they have to try to f find a connection. And so they give me all these photos to see if I know who he is, but I don't know who he is. So I never pick him out of a photo. And so it's a year-long investigation by the DA's office before they actually um, exonerate us. Wow. Yeah. So they, yeah, so they just had to, 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 to string it out even a little bit longer. Yeah. But then you do get exonerated. Then I do get so exonerated. So then you're in prison. So I'm in prison. And you get the word that you're exonerated. I get the Somehow. word that I'm exonerated. My dad, I'm, I, I'm talking to my father on the phone, and he, and he says... You know, uh, I said, yo, they keep questioning about the old case. And he's like, yeah, because I got something to tell you. And I go, what? And he says, because he's been watching the news. And it's all over the news, and he sees it. And, and he, this time he's he's in touch with the lawyers. And he goes, you know, they found a the guy who did it. And and I'm like, what? And he says, yeah, they found him. You're getting ready to come home. And I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Like, I was so institutionalized that I didn't even believe him. I hung up the phone on him. And I said, you know what? I don't even want to talk to you no more. You just ruined my day. And I hung up the phone on him, right? And it, and it wasn't until uh, I actually got the call from my attorneys that, yeah, you're going to be exonerated. Wow. Yeah. And then how long was it before you got home? Um, We got exonerated December 5th, and then I was home. My lawyer said, I'll get you home before Christmas. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And he got me home December 22nd. And when you, when you did finally get that news that you were exonerated and when you actually believed it, yeah. uh, what happened? Did you collapse? Did you like, <laughs> start crying, laughing, well, like, jumping? I, I, I cried I cry when I found out about Reyes. And, um, but I was still in disbelief, and it wasn't until I actually got, until I got released. They, they, they sent me to Queensboro, and then they released me from there. And then for the first time, I actually got to see the magnitude of the press, of how much cameras and, and lights and... Because I never really been in that situation. That was the first time for me, so it was really overwhelming. Like it was like, wow, you know. 
Well, and now uh, let's just talk for a minute mm -hmm. about what life is like now. I know you're doing a lot of public speaking, yeah. raising awareness. Definitely. Um, I know you. Uh, every, everyone knows that there was a settlement. Yeah. Which you guys, uh, I, I don't think you could ever pay enough for what you've been through. But um, but you're good now, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, and um, you got some money in the bank. Definitely. Right? Um, I see you got good style, right? <laughs> you got your, you got your, uh, he, he's, he, you can't see it on the radio, but he's looking good. <laughs> and, uh, you got a great smile. And so, uh, so, and now, now you have a family? Yes. My daughter's 12 years old. Um, I've been married now two years. Yeah. Nice. So, so I'm trying to put the pieces together back slowly but surely. Well, it sounds like you're doing a hell of a job. And I'm trying. I, I'll I'm tell trying. you something. You know, it, it just just being with you and hearing that story and and knowing that you've come through this uh, with an incredible spirit mm -hmm. and with an incredible attitude, uh, it, it's it's really an, it's an inspiration to to so many people. Mm -hmm. I don't think you even know. And now uh, I'm hoping that with this uh, Wrongful Eviction podcast, uh, we'll reach a lot more people. Definitely. Many of whom will have heard parts of your story yeah. or seen the movie again, the Central Park Five. Incredible movie. Mm -hmm. You get a chance to see it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I'm hoping that, again, that this will help to make a difference in the lives of some other people. Definitely. And, uh, you know, I really just appreciate you coming in and sharing your story and your strength and, and hope and... And, uh, and and wisdom and uh, you know as a New Yorker mm -hmm. I, I want to apologize to you from all of us that you ever had to go through this um, and uh, having lived through it I couldn't have known you know it was so one-sided depressed yeah. I had no idea and now to be sitting here with you now it's really a, it's kind of a thrill for me to be honest and uh, and and yeah I'm, I'm, I'm like I said I just really want to thank you for being here on the show pleasure thank you for having me I want to thank the good people at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law for providing us research and background information on these cases. Be sure to check out our website, wrongfulconvictionpodcast.com. Today's show was produced by Mia Lobel, Sarah Barrett, Jenna Ruggiero, and Ben Greenberg, with a special thanks to Stephen Hobbs. Engineering by Chris Guevara and Flawn Williams. The music in the show is by J. Ralph. This is Wrongful Conviction with Jason Flom. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. It combines supportive memory foams to create an award-winning sleep service with just the right sink and just the right bounce. With over 20,000 reviews, think about that, 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress based on Casper, Amazon, and Google reviews. I mean, those are some names you can trust. Free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada. Try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. But you're going to love it, so don't even worry about it. Designed, developed, and assembled in the USA. Get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash wrongful. That's www.casper.com slash wrongful. Remember, this is only applicable to the purchase of a mattress, and terms and conditions do apply.